Hi guys, Jordan here from True Crime UK. Please be advised that I'll be talking about murder today, so viewer discretion is advised. If you're new to this channel, please subscribe and leave me a thumbs up as it truly does help the channel. Also, hit the bell for notifications for when I release my videos. Now, in March 2013, a series of crimes were committed in Peterborough, Cambridgeshire. A 30-year-old female named Joanne Dennehy was later convicted of the crimes and became one of only three women to receive a whole life order, the other two being Rose West and Myra Hindley. This video is about the events surrounding Joanne Dennehy, whose crimes would later become known as the Peterborough Ditch Murders. Joanne Christine Dennehy was born in Harpenden in August 1982. Her childhood was normal and pretty much straightforward. She was described by most as loving and sensitive. Dennehy always had good reports from school and was described by her teachers as a nice girl. When Dennehy reached her early teens, a dramatic shift in her personality occurred. She started to skip school and become involved with petty crime leading to several arrests. At age 14, Dennehy started a relationship with John Trina, six years her elder. They had two children together, and after John noticed a violent change in Dennehy's behaviour, self-harm, excessive drinking, sleeping with other men, sometimes she would disappear in the night and get drunk, and send the men round to beat John up, fabricating a reason. This was the final straw. John took their daughters and moved far away from her, not telling Dennehy their location, as to protect his children. Dennehy separated herself from her family, left home and pursued a life of crime, serving several short-term prison sentences for theft and carrying weapons in a public place. After being released from prison after serving a 14-week prison term for theft, Dennehy was in need of accommodation and the local council put her in contact with a local letting agent named Kevin Lee. Kevin had a business called Quicklet that let rooms out to homeless and vulnerable people. Most of the property was in the Orton Goldhay area of Peterborough. The vetting process of proposed tenants was basically non-existent. Everyone that went to the council with immediate home and needs, whatever their background, would be pointed in the way of Kevin Lee and Quicklet. She told Kevin Lee that she had just served eight years in prison for murdering her father who she said had raped her. She also said she had burnt two people to death in a house fire and run two people over in a car. So for her eight years she had killed a lot of people. All this of course was a massive lie. Dennehy would later become known as a major liar with psychopathic tendencies. Kevin Lee wanted to help Dennehy, but in the same breath saw an opportunity to help himself. Dennehy had a friend that he always by her side. He was 7 foot 3 inch, aptly named Gary Stretch. Lee thought that the pair could be ideal to help him with troubles and tenants. Lee was also very attracted to Dennehy, so he used to let her live in one of his houses rent free. He would also shower her with gifts. Along with her rent-free room, Lee allowed her to keep the housing benefit check every month. Dennehy and Stretch would bully people into either paying up the back rent or moving out of Lee's properties. Something Lee was unable to do without the pair's help. On the 29th of March 2013, Lee had arranged to meet Dennehy at one of his properties. Kevin Lee never returned home after that meeting. After numerous attempts to reach Kevin by text and voice calls, Kevin's wife reported him missing to the police. Then next day, police discovered Kevin Lee's car burnt out on a remote farm track near Yaxley. Shortly after, Kevin Lee's body was discovered in a ditch by the A16 by a dog walker. His body was laying on the edge of a drainage ditch wearing a black dress that had been pulled up around the waist in a humiliating fashion. The dress had several holes in that were identified as knife marks. Lee had been stabbed five times in the chest. The wounds had penetrated both lungs and his heart. Police opened a murder investigation, but the area where Kevin was found was very remote, which meant there was no witnesses or no CCTV, making the investigation harder. Police then decided to examine Kevin's phone records. Through the police investigation, it was found that someone's mobile phone was in the same remote proximity at the approximate time that Kevin's car was burnt out. That phone belonged to Joanne Dennehy. Dennehy then became a suspect very early on in the police investigation. Police then visited the address that Dennehy had been staying at 38 Byfield. Dennehy was nowhere to be seen, but upon entry the police were greeted by a blood-stained mattress propped up against a rear garden fence. The blood was tested, but it did not match Kevin Lee's. Police had learned that another of Lee's tenants had been reported missing. He was a retired Navy veteran by the name of John Chapman. Police then decided to turn to the media for help tracking down Dennehy and a giant sidekick stretch. 
A seven foot man and a woman with a tattoo of a star on her face is hardly inconspicuous and will be noticed by people for sure. A police officer from Norfolk come forward. He was investigating a drive off and theft from a petrol station. A girl had gone into the shop, stole some items and then made off in the car without paying. Police now had the pair's car reg thanks to the garage CCTV. Police could now use the automated number plate recognition computer. The pair's car was picked up on a camera on the M5 traveling towards the southwest. During this journey, the pair were frequently caught on CCTV. They were getting low on cash, so they started to steal items to sell. A friend of Stretch put them in touch with a former thief named Mark Lloyd. Upon meeting the pair, Lloyd walked into the room and within minutes, Denner here pulled out a blade and said, I've already killed three, I want to kill some more. Lloyd immediately felt uncomfortable and felt as though he had to do as asked or be attacked. Lloyd later stated that it was blatantly obvious that Dennehy had complete control over Gary Stretch. Dennehy needed to get to Hereford to sell some stolen goods. Lloyd was told that he would be going with them, no question. On the journey, Dennehy was drinking whiskey and becoming more and more and more intoxicated. After a visit to a local shop to buy cigarettes, then he got back into the car and said to Stretch, I want my fun now, find me a victim. No women, no children. Within 30 seconds, Stretch pointed to someone and said, will he do? The man was retired firefighter, Robin Baretza. Robin was going about his own business walking his dog when Dennehy casually walked up behind him. Robin was stabbed twice in the body and was left with potential life-threatening injuries. This attack was at 3 p.m. So there could well have been children around coming home from school. After the attack, Dennehy calmly got back into the car, kissed Stretch on the cheek and said, I want to do some more, and asked Stretch to find her another victim. They then drove around searching for another victim. Stretch noticed 56-year-old John Rogers. What about him? Stretch said. Rogers was also out walking his dog. Dennehy again got out of the car and casually walked up to Rogers and viciously attacked him. Rogers was stabbed more than 30 times in the back, chest and stomach. Both his lungs had been punctured and he was left fighting for his life. After the attack, Dennehy again casually returned to the car, got in and said to Stretch, that was nice, that was nice, I need to do some more. Seriously injured John Rogers had managed to crawl 100 yards to the main road where he received help from a member of the public. At a small row of shops near the final attack location, Johan Dennehy's attack and spree finally came to an end when armed police surrounded and approached the pair's car. Dennehy still had the knife in her hand upon arrest. All three occupants of the car were all arrested without incident. Police stated they were sure the attacks on innocent members of the public would have continued if they hadn't been arrested at that time. Dennehy and Stretch and Lloyd were taken to Hereford Police Station. In the custody booking area, Dennehy was laughing and joking with the officers clearly enjoying the moment, being centre of attention and showing no remorse for what she had done. Have you got for attempted murder in love? I wouldn't, but... No, but I'm just smiling. Attempted and murder. Attempted murder and murder. Thank you. 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 Then he was detained under suspicion of murder and two attempted murders. But unknown to police, more was to follow. A call come through on police radio stating a body had been found at Thorny Dyke. Police suspected it to be the missing Navy vet, John Chapman, who was still missing. Almost immediately, another call over the police radio to say they had found a second body. The first body was indeed John Chapman, who had gone missing from the shared house with Joanne Dennehy. It was found that Chapman had been killed in his bedroom, possibly whilst intoxicated as Chapman was known to be a bit of a drinker. He had several stab wounds in his chest and the bloodstained mattress that was found in the back garden earlier was his. The second body was identified as Lucas Slabeski, Lucas lived in a very hectic high lifestyle and was a regular drug user. His last known movements was on the 19th of March at a cash point machine. Shortly after this, he was to visit Dennehy at one of Kevin Lee's properties. Lucas was attacked on the property and stabbed multiple times, piercing his heart. Dennehy made no secret about this murder and had told several people what she had done. Lucas's body was put into a wheelie bin for several days before being dumped at Thorny Dyke. 
but not before Dennehy showing off had showed Luca's body to a 14 year old girl. Police had a mountain of evidence and charged Dennehy with three counts of murder and two counts of attempted murder. On the 18th of November 2013, Dennehy attended a pre-trial at the Old Bailey. The police were preparing for a long drawn out trial but were shocked when Dennehy pleaded guilty. On the February 28, 2014 at the Old Bailey, Mr Justice Spencer handed her a full life order. Like I said earlier, she is the only third woman to get this. Rose West, Myra Hindley, Joanne Dennehy. The judge told Dennehy that she was a cruel, calculating, selfish and manipulative serial killer. Dennehy just laughed when told she would spend the rest of her life behind bars. Gary Stretch was charged with three accounts of preventing the lawful burying of a body and two further accounts of attempted murder. He was sentenced to life imprisonment and told he must serve a minimum of 19 years. Ex-con Mark Lloyd was found to have no case to answer. Out of all the crimes I've researched, I found this one to be one of the most disturbing, mainly for the random attacks, one after the other, and if she had not been caught, then she probably would have carried on attacking innocent people. She also blatantly didn't care if she was caught or not. When you start just attacking random members of the public for absolutely no reason whatsoever, claiming it's fun, then you definitely should never get out of prison when you are caught. And we're all lucky that she won't ever get out. These victims could have been me, you, members of our family just going about normal everyday things. Joanne Dennehy will go down in history as one of the most evil serial killers in the UK. But my last thought is this, people that do major good on a large scale are never remembered. But people that do evil things like Dennehy become notorious and are remembered for many years.